All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Majeska Simkin School for Human Rights. That was, of course, the great Paul Robeson, who was singing Old Man River. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Paul Robeson was, as, as Brett referred to him before we began class this evening, a true Renaissance man in every sense of the word. Uh, as one of the greatest football players in the history of Princeton University, uh, was an intellect in his own right, a wonderful singer, a wonderful actor. He was everything under the sun. In fact, at one point during the 1940s, you can make a case that Paul Robeson was one of the most famous men in the world. Certainly one of the most famous men in the world who wasn't leading a country during World War II. But Robinson's experiences in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, uh, first in America as a black man attending Princeton and later on, or attending Rutgers, excuse me, and then later on as a black man who traveled abroad to act and to sing, really pushed him into the camp of socialism by the 1930s and 40s. He performed for audiences on the Republican side during the Spanish Civil War, and certainly during World War II, he saw the war against fascism as a war that absolutely had to be won both abroad in Europe and at home in America against Jim Crow racism and fascism. Now, the thing about Robeson, of course, is that by the time period we're discussing this evening, the 1946 to 54 time period, Robeson Association and steadfast belief in communism and the Soviet Union as the wave of the future would draw not only criticism, but outright condemnation and harassment and oppression from the US government. And so Robinson, who was so well known in the 30s and 40s, was almost virtually forgotten outside of Black American circles by the early 1960s. Uh, in fact, so much so that in the 60s, many Americans referred to Robeson in the past tense, even though he didn't pass away until 1976. But in a way, Robeson, in so many different ways, represents what we're talking about this evening, how the 1946 to 54 time period represents a watershed in American history, not just in terms of race relations, not just in terms of the history of South Carolina, but also how the United States itself dealt with these questions of fascism, democracy, and communism in the immediate post-war world. And I wanted to read to you guys a quote from a Mississippi Delta planter uh, who, who was talking during World War II about how he and many other white Southerners saw the Second World War. I'm just gonna read this quote uh, from a letter he wrote to his congressman. Quote, are we fighting this war to destroy everything we inherited from our forefathers? This is a conservative war. It is not a war for fascism, Nazism, communism, socialism, New Dealism, or democracy, end quote. And this was a feeling that many white Southerners had at the end of World War II, despite the rhetoric about the double V campaign, despite the rhetoric about everything that was being said about the US government during the World War II era about promoting freedom and democracy abroad, many white Southerners said, we're fighting this war to keep the status quo at home. Many African-Americans on the other hand said, well, uh, not so fast, my friends. Uh, we fought this war to save democracy abroad and at home too. And of course, these two competing visions could not coincide. So let's go ahead and get started with today's um, conversation. And what we're gonna do this evening is, we're not gonna go in quite chronological order. Instead, we're gonna go at it thematically. So we're gonna begin by talking about what's going on in the state with Jimmy Burns, with uh, the Equal Campaign and so on and so forth. And then later on this evening, We'll get to talking about the Southern Negro Youth Congress, uh, what brings them to Columbia in 1946, and so on and so forth. So uh, again, as always uh, with our class, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. I'll do the best I can to keep up with those and answer them uh, as, as much as I can. But as you might notice, by the way, if you look at the most uh, recent lesson for class four, we're only covering eight years. The last few lessons covered entire centuries, entire generations, and then we just kind of pumped the brakes here for eight years. And I think you're gonna see pretty soon why that was the case, because a hell of a lot happens between 1946 and 1954, a lot of which unfortunately is not known by most Americans. We tend to gloss over this era of US history, 
and to keep going to Brown v. Board. But tonight, we're going to pump the brakes and talk a bit more in detail about what's going on in South Carolina and the world, or South Carolina and the world during this time. So I'm going to actually bring us uh, back for a moment to our, our good friend, Jimmy Burns. Um, and of course, I think by now you note that my sarcasm is incredibly dry uh, when I say good friend, Jimmy Burns. But James F. Burns was one of the most prominent Americans in the mid to late 1940s. As we discussed in class three, Burns himself in the 1930s was a stalwart ally of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal program. Uh, during the 1940s, he served briefly on the Supreme Court before joining President Roosevelt's World War II era administration. Now, after that, in 1945, he becomes Secretary of State under Harry S. Truman. And in 1947, he's actually named uh, Time Magazine's Man of the Year. And this is really more so because of his leadership in terms of foreign policy in the beginnings of the Cold War era. As Brett mentioned in, la in our last class, James Burns was one of the chief architects of our early Cold War policies. Uh, and that would include dropping the atomic bomb on Japan in 1945, that's in the measures of the Soviet Union. That would include negotiations over what happened in Eastern Europe right after World War II and by 1947, Burns is seen as one of the chief leaders of our policies vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc during the early Cold War years. Again, a very dangerous time in world history where it appeared a third world war was actually quite likely. Now, the irony here is that Burns would eventually leave the position of Secretary of State by 1948. Uh, many felt that he left because of frustration with President Truman uh, ironically enough, Truman felt that Burns was not hardline enough on the Soviet Union. There's some correspondence between the two men where if you read the letters, it's quite clear that Truman is telling Burns, you've got to do more to take on a harder stance against the Soviet Union. While at the same time, there was some feeling amongst Burns and his contemporaries that really Burns should have been president, that there was still animosity over the 1944 Democratic Convention when Burns was not offered the position of vice president, as many assumed he would be offered in that year. Nonetheless, Burns' leadership as Secretary of State once again shows just how much of a role South Carolina plays in the formation of US foreign policy. And I wanna leave that, that kernel of, of, of an idea in your head because it will be very important when we talk about the 1960s and 70s, especially when you look at folks like Strom Thurmond and their importance to foreign policy. And even today, you look at Senator Lin Lindsey Graham, for example, and his importance to the conservative wing of foreign policy in America today. All right, so let's keep going, shall we? Now, while Burns is leaving his role as Secretary of State, I do also want to set up the legal battles that are going on in the 1930s and 40s and 50s uh, thanks partly to the end, primarily actually the NAACP. During this time period, the NAACP is pursuing a legal strategy that in the long run, they hope, will actually really break the back of segregation across the South. The first attempt, of course, would be to try to push for equalization amongst some of these Black schools, universities across the South. Uh, you have various legal cases in the 1930s and 40s, some of which we talked about in the last class. But the legal strategy by the 1940s, on the one hand, is starting to pay off. You are starting to see Southern states setting up graduate schools and law schools for Black residents. Namely, in South Carolina, you have the formation of a law school at South Carolina State University by 1947. But at the same time, there are also limits to this strategy. Um, which the NAACP is starting to run up against by the late 1940s. And this is again really important because by 1951, not just in South Carolina, but across the South, you are starting to see many segregationist politicians promoting this idea of a moderate, quote unquote, moderate Jim Crow policy. And certainly one of the progenitors of that idea is James Burns himself, who becomes 
at age 68, the oldest governor in the history of South Carolina in 1951. Burns isn't quite done yet with making history on behalf of South Carolina. After a career in Congress, in the Senate, in the Supreme Court, uh, Secretary of State, I mean, Burns had literally done it all at this point, except serve as governor. And so now he has become governor of South Carolina in 1951, at a moment in the state's history where the very ideas of segregation are under attack as never before. And we'll, we'll get into why that's the case in just a brief moment. Uh, well, I mean, I, just being just a little bit pregnant, I, I think your, your sentiment is certainly appreciated there <laughs> in the chat, but I think you have a good point there. Um, again, moderate Jim Crow to us seems like an oxymoron. Um, but I, I, I mentioned this because throughout the course of Southern history, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that racism and white supremacy is at the heart of so much of it, along with, with capitalism, class exploitation, gender discrimination, and the like. But throughout Southern history, you've always had different wings of how exactly to keep those systems in place. Um, and in South Carolina in particular, the politics of the state from really, and I'm, I'm, I'm only partially joking here, from the formation of Carolina Colony in 1660 until really the, the late 20th century, the politics of the state can be summed up as white supremacy, uh, either white supremacy in some sort of moderate form, palatable form, or white supremacy in terms of a more violent extremist form. Now, the thing is, is that they often coincide and combine in very interesting ways. But for Burns in particular, his idea is, let's try to show the nation that South Carolina can lead the way in a moderate, sensible Jim Crow policy. Now, to us today, this sounds like absolute nonsense, um, as the president would say, malarkey, perhaps. But in the 1950s, you have to understand the context of this, that Burns and other Southern leaders kind of see the writing on the wall. They're, they're seeing how the NAACP and other organizations are getting more and more aggressive about pushing back against segregation and Jim Crowism. Um, and no, it, it actually, they called it, like Burns and his allies called it a moderate idea of Jim Crow segregation um, because they acknowledged the fact that they were trying to find what they considered a sensible center in politics where they weren't going to cave in to NAACP demands uh, for desegregation. But at the same time, Burns and others would argue, we have to at least recognize that there are some issues in the South that we have to ameliorate as best we can. Now, with that being said, and Bert, Brady, you wanna to add to that real quick? I just wanted to say that, that uh, Burns could have been Truman's vice president with the exception of him being too, uh, too hard. Uh, a Jim Crow liner. So he, it was depending on where you're standing, what his line looked like. Precisely. No, you're exactly right. I mean, that, and I think that's, that's again, the, the central curse of being a politician from South Carolina. This idea that if you're going to be nationally prominent from the Palmetto State, you can only go so far. Think of a John C. Calhoun before him, or think of a Strom Thurmond afterwards, where there, there's, a, there's a ceiling to which you can reach as a South Carolinian because you have to hold these stances that will make the folks back in South Carolina happy, but may make you a bit of an extremist on the national level, uh, whether through your own policies or rhetoric or both. You know? So again, you have James Burns, and then you also have Marion Grissett, who you know, I think is also a person that is really important to talk about in terms of local resistance to civil rights in South Carolina. Now, Grissett was in the state Senate, it seemed for like a thousand years, but only, only about 30 plus years. Uh, but while he was there, uh, he headed a committee that in later years was referred to looking back as the schools committee, but was actually called the segregation committee or the Grissett committee. And basically marrying Grissett's chief aim while in this, the state Senate was to make sure that segregation was kept as the law of the land in South Carolina 
especially when it came to its school system. Now, in 1951, when this committee is first founded, um, there are a couple of things going on. Now, number one, um, Senator Burns, oh, excuse me, Governor Burns himself has already pushed the state legislature to begin funding in increasing numbers um, black schools across the state. And what happens is the state legislature passes in the first time in the state's history, a sales tax in order to pay for what would be over 700 new schools for African-Americans throughout South Carolina. Um, and these were modern schools, with brick, with glass, they, they look very nice. Um, and of course, you're, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, what is, what is South Carolina doing building all these new schools for Black people? Well, let's just say it wasn't out of the goodness of their hearts. Uh, it was because of the Briggs v. Elliott case. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in uh, Cecil to talk about the equalization campaign a little bit later on. So I'm kind of giving just the basic rundown of it right now. But essentially with the Briggs v. Elliott case, Eliza and Harry, Harry Briggs, uh, they were parents of, of school children in Clarendon County, South Carolina. And essentially their initial ask was, well, can we just get some school buses for our kids? Their argument being one that was under the idea of separate but equal. The argument being, well, if you're gonna say separate but equal, can you at least mean the equal part in terms of access to school buses? Now, this, this actually begins with a petition that was sent around in 1949. It leads to the Briggs v. Elliott case in 1951. But during the Briggs v. Elliott case, uh, you do have some examples of genuine heroism on, uh, by uh, many African-Americans who live in Clarendon County and throughout South Carolina. Uh, for example, you have Reverend Joseph Delane, who was a civil rights advocate in Clarendon County who's trying to offer support to the Briggs family. Now, the thing is, is that with the petition that was sent that really sparked this case, I want everybody to remember this, especially for those of you who are taking this class with an eye towards future activism. In the late 40s and early 1950s in particular, in South Carolina, to be a black person and to publicly say that you were supporting this case, the Briggs v. Elliott case, was to quite literally put everything on the line. Now we'll talk about Reverend Joseph Delane and, and his fate in just a moment, but some of the folks who supported Briggs v. Elliott lost their jobs, lost their livelihood. The Briggs themselves had a very difficult time making ends meet after the case went to trial. And in fact, uh, folks like Majeska Simpkins would actually rally the, the Black community to offer support and aid however they could, because many of the families that signed that petition to push for an equitable education system in Clarendon County lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods, lost their homes. And so Simpkins was actually soliciting aid and assistance from all across the United States in order to help these families make in ends meet during the Briggs v. Elliott case. So again, when we're talking about what's going on in South Carolina locally, you have to remember that what's happening within the borders of the state don't, doesn't simply end there. That in fact, the eyes of the nation were certainly turned towards what was going on in Clarendon County, South Carolina. The NAACP, is certainly trying to push this case as an example of how they could finally break the back of segregation across the South. And again, as I said before, uh, Governor Burns' reaction was to push for a sales tax to fund new Black schools, really because he's thinking, if this goes to the federal courts, which of course it did, then Governor Burns was arguing, well, we could say that in South Carolina, we were actually trying to uphold the equal portion of separate but equal. And you continue to see across the, during the 1950s that other Southern states are also starting to follow up the same strategy of starting to raise sales taxes, other taxes in an attempt 
to fund more and more schools for Black Americans to stave off the ideas of desegregation. And again, if you were in our deeper dive last Monday, you heard from uh, Melissa Brown talking about the consequences of that desegregation effort, especially on Black schools, on Black teachers, on Black educators. Now, the Briggs v. Elliott decision is, of course, one of the most momentous events in the state's history. Uh, it becomes, of course, uh, national and international news, more so because of the cases it's associated with, which we'll talk about in a second. But with the Briggs v. Elliott case being fought out in federal court in Charleston, the man you see on the right, Judge Wadey's wearing, is basically telling Thurgood Marshall, the NAACP legal counsel, that you know pushing for equalization is one thing, but that's not good enough. And and Waring is really pushing this idea on Thurman, or excuse me, on on Thurgood Marshall and others that now is probably the time to push for an end to Plessy v. Ferguson, to an end of separate but equal. And really, this Briggs v. Elliott case, uh, once it gets to the Supreme Court by 1953-54, it does become part of a series of several cases, which we all know today as the Brown v. Board of Education decision of 1954. Now, let me just take a look. I see there's something else in the chat. OK. and. I think it's it's worth noting the national context of this too by the early 1950s. If I can pull it up, I'll stop sharing my screen for just a quick second and I'll share another document with you guys. Um, so during this time period, one of the things that Burns and other Southerners are hoping for is that President Dwight D. Eisenhower will, will see their side on this. And this is a letter, this is actually from the Dwight D. Eisenhower Presidential Library. Um, they have a, a series of letters that are posted online. You can look at, I'll post a link to this later on in the chat for folks who want to look at it on their own time. But this is actually a letter from Governor Burns to President Eisenhower, November 1953, where um, Burns, as you can see here, he's already trying to get out in front of his concerns over what the Supreme Court may rule the following year, 1954, with Brown v. Board. Um, and some of this language may seem rather familiar to you guys. So you see um, in the second paragraph, uh, talking about how they're going to defend segregation, he says, in the brief, our counsel will argue that the United States Supreme Court and every other court, federal and state, that has ever considered this question has held that the 14th Amendment did not prohibit a state from enacting a law requiring separation of races in public schools, provided equal facilities were furnished all students. The question now is whether you will ask the Supreme Court to reverse its decisions and declare that the 14th Amendment now means something the court has heretofore said it did not mean. In the very next line, the court has no right to legislate. And if you look down a little bit further in that third paragraph, he says there are five cases pending. The court might well conclude the conditions in Kansas, that's where Brown v. Board is from, Brown Board of Education, speak of Kansas, were such that a law making a distinction between the races was unreasonable. The court might say that in the South Carolina case, with the number of colored students in the school district in questions is 10 to every one white student, again, talking about Clarendon County, the court cannot say that the action of the state is manifestly unreasonable, end quote. And so Burns's idea here is to really, he and other leaders in South Carolina kind of see what's, what's going to happen. They're, they're trying to get out in front of it as soon as they possibly can. But as we all know, in 1954, um, thanks to the efforts of the NAACP and thanks to, to social sciences and others who are trying to make a case uh, essentially against segregation, they're going to rule unanimously that Plessy v. Ferguson is unconstitutional um, in the Brown v. Bohr case. But I want to keep something in mind here. Again, I always tell my students context is king. 
And that's certainly the case here. Brown v. Board is unanimous partly because the federal government is pushing in favor of desegregation because of the Cold War. The U.S. State Department actually files a brief in Brown v. Board because they're saying, hey, look, the entire world is watching. We have to make sure we get this absolutely right. In particular, they are concerned not so much about the Soviet Union as they are about the peoples of Africa and Asia, the so-called third world, uh, the peoples who are, who are coming to their own as fully independent countries who are watching to see which of the two power blocks is actually going to mean it when they say we stand for freedom and justice for all. In addition to that, while the Supreme Court does rule unanimously um, that they are in favor of desegregation, that Plessy v. Ferguson is unconstitutional, the Supreme Court itself does not quite say how this is to be done. Um, they, they don't quite give clear and explicit instructions about how this is supposed to happen. Uh, now, real, real quick, I see a question in the chat. In regards to legislators and political leaders, was integration thought of as a cheaper solution? It seems that it all boils down to economics. And that's actually a good question. Um, there has been a lot of work done by Southern historians about the cost of segregation. And, and you, you're actually right. I mean, if they just built integrated schools from the get-go, it might be cheaper for the state overall. But their devotion to ideology, in this case, white supremacist ideology, overruled any considerations of economics. Um, in fact, it has been argued that the South itself lost millions, if not billions of dollars thanks to white supremacy and segregation after the American Civil War, going deep into the 20th century. I'll give you a very quick example, which actually is an example tied to the news in, in the present day, especially for those of you who are baseball fans. So 1965, this is a little bit after our class, but 1965, when there's talk of putting professional sports teams in the deep South for the first time ever, not minor league teams, but actual major league teams, the city of Atlanta is seen as the most likely candidate because after all, it is the city too busy to hate. Um, and as a native Georgian, I can tell you that's absolute, whatever adjective you wanna put in there, but it's not quite true. But the city fathers of Atlanta were told, you can get a new a football team, you can get the Milwaukee Braves, so on and so forth, but your facilities have to be desegregated before we can award you those teams. And so Atlanta, promptly desegregates its sporting facilities to make absolutely sure they can get those major league teams in the Falcons and the Braves to come to Atlanta in 1965-66. I mention that example because throughout most of the 20th century, the white South was not willing to make the kinds of compromises necessary to draw business and such to the deep South unless they could draw those businesses to the South with the idea that we could continue to exploit our economic base, however we could. Now, you can make a case, a very logical one, that the South has figured out new and interesting ways to manipulate its labor class, its working classes since the civil rights era. That's certainly true. But throughout most of the 20th century, even with the possibility of, of things being cheaper, they simply went an integrationist route, the idea of white supremacy was just way too strong. Uh, it overruled virtually everything else that the white South considered during the 20th century. And of course, a lot of the money they were making in the 20th century came from that exploitation of labor, black and white, because of the building of the color line during and after the Reconstruction era throughout the 20th century. Now, the South initially is unsure of what to make of the Brown v. Board decision. In fact, there's some very interesting um, literature about the South's immediate reaction. Some Southerners actually said, uh, whatever, I guess we'll move on, it's law of the land now, what have you. But many other white Southerners took their time to look at the decision and to figure out, well, how do we delay this as much as we possibly can? Now, the Supreme Court, uh, in its infinite wisdom, actually helps in that regard with the Brown II decision the following year. And in Brown 2, um, the Supreme Court uses the language that would basically stymie these aggregation efforts for a generation. 
when they would say that in terms of desegregating schools in the South, it should be done with, quote, with all deliberate speed, end quote. Now, the cartoon you see before you is, is a rather humorous take on the NAACP trying to speed up that deliberate speed as much as they possibly can with Thurgood Marshall at the head of the desegregation special. But all, all jokes aside, this phrase with all deliberate speed may be the four most important words in Southern history in the middle of the 20th century, because it's gonna delay progress and segregation for years, for decades, really for a generation or two. Um, as was pointed out last week by, by Dr. Brown, for example, Charleston doesn't really desegregate its schools until 1963, nearly a decade after the Brown v. Board case. Um, I can tell you my own mother who grew up in Augusta, Georgia, did not go to a desegregated school until 1970. And so this kind of thing is, again, showing how despite some of the successes of the NAACP and other groups in fighting for civil rights, there's still a lot of work left to be done. And let me just go back really quickly to Joseph Delane and the folks in Clarendon County. One of the problems with how we teach the Brown v. Board case in K through 12, even to an extent in college, it is not only that we ignore what happened with Briggs v. Elliott and other cases, but in particular, we ignore the price that was paid by many of these folks during and after the case, cases themselves. Now, Joseph Delane, of course, uh, his church was, was, his house was shot at. Uh, he was basically forced to leave the state, never really had a chance to come back. The Briggs themselves lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods. Many other petitioners had a difficult time finding work because again, their names were public knowledge. And so they were targeted for years after the Briggs case went to the Supreme Court because they had stepped out of line with how things were supposed to be done in South Carolina. South Carolina likes to promote itself as a state where moderation ruled the day, where moderation won out and things weren't quite as violent as they were in say Mississippi or Alabama or Tennessee or elsewhere. But my friends, that's simply not true. And the Briggs v. Elliott case is a reminder of that um, as is some of the other things we're gonna discuss this evening. Um, but what I want to do uh, really quickly, yeah, a very, very low bar, I mean, I mean, the bar is so low, it's practically below the ground. But, but again, this is how South Carolina, and I know a lot of folks have been asking, why didn't I learn this before? Why haven't I heard about this before? Or why is it that when we learn about the civil rights movement, it is certain images, the Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, et cetera. It is because when it comes to teaching and writing and talking about history in the public realm, and I'm talking about even the classroom or universities or schools, but just what's in the air of public conversations about history. Americans tend to struggle with the complexities of our own past. Um, that's a nice way of me saying, we really don't like, well, I say we, I mean, most Americans do not like acknowledging the price that was paid by so many of their fellow citizens to help make this country warts and all, and Lord knows we have a lot of warts right now, what it is today. But with Briggs v. Elliott, I think there is a special shame in how so much of this, even within South Carolina, has been suppressed in terms of how it's taught, how people learn about the Briggs v. Elliott case, and how the price paid by Joseph Delane and others is still largely glossed over. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it, often American history teaching is, is revisionist or, or yeah, openly white supremacist, I think is, is a fair way to put it in, in a lot of cases. There's a lot of work that has to be done amongst historians um, in, in colleges, universities, and K through 12 to fix this issue. I mean, just last week, the state government in South Carolina has started debating using the 1776 commission as a guide by which students in K through 12 should learn American history. 
a, a decision that many educators here are certainly not happy with. It will make our jobs 10 times harder than they already are. Okay, so go ahead and stop my share. Brett, go, go right ahead. Well, I just want to point out a, a couple little notes that you raised there with that letter from uh, Burns to the president. I hadn't seen that before. But what it does is it, it, it substantiates the broadly accepted observation that everybody in the world would know Briggs the Elliot instead of Brown versus the board if it had not been for Jimmy. And that, that Topeka, that little argument he, speak, he talked to, to uh, was Eisenhower about, about mm -hmm. Topeka, they wanted a case that wasn't so egregious. Please keep the spotlight off South Carolina. And that's like one point I wanted to make about, about Burns's ability. He was a Supreme Court justice and he'd quit that. So he was positioned to make that argument. And that the, um, his segue into um, being the anti-communist fellow was in, in direct relationship with blaming the movement for black equality on communist influence. And so that the, the beginning of the, the beginning of the second Red Scare had a lot to do with Jimmy Burns. Definitely. And that's something we're going to talk more about uh, this evening when we get to talking about the 1946 um, SNCC conference. Um, real quick, I'm going to leave in the chat. This is actually a link to some of those letters that were sent to and from Eisenhower about the Brown v. Board case. So there's some good stuff from not only Jimmy Burns, but other Southern politicians as well, trying to shape opinion about the the Brown v. Board case. And it's worth noting that President Eisenhower himself was, to put it charitably, a bit lukewarm on the issue of civil rights. Um, ultimately, he felt it was an issue of law and order in the sense that if the Supreme Court says this has to be done, then he's going to go ahead and enforce the laws. But Eisenhower was also incredibly skeptical about efforts to push through civil rights in Congress because he felt that most Americans simply weren't ready for it. He was really of the opinion of a more gradual campaign for civil rights. But at the same time as president, Eisenhower also had one eye on international opinion. Um, and so he's also thinking about the Cold War and the struggle for hearts and minds in Africa and Asia as well. So what I wanted to do uh, for a few minutes was, uh, see, so I see you're, you're on the call. I want to turn the floor over to you to talk a bit more about those equalization campaigns, if you don't mind. So, um, and Cecil's putting some of the speeches in the chat right now. So Cecil, floor is yours. Um, thank you, Dr. Green. I um, want to refer to- uh, Cecil, Cecil, yeah. excuse me. People have, uh, let me tell people why you're talking. <laughs> Cecil is a, um, an employee of the National Education Association. Cecil knows more about the South Carolina Educational Association than anybody in the South Carolina Educational Association. So Cecil's a, relatively an expert on this matter. So I'm just kind of grounding you that this guy didn't come out of left field. Well, he did come out of left field, but he didn't come out of right field. Left field is better, right. Um, since we're talking about uh, Burns's speeches, I want to uh, raise up one sentence from the last speech he delivered to the legislature in January of 1955, because I think that frames the rest of what I'll share with you. He, he, he said, but I want to speak about our public schools because that problem more than any other one thing caused me to become a candidate for governor in 1950. So in that uh, sentence, he, he uh, sets up that he intended to do uh, for public education uh, what he uh, ultimately did do. To further set the stage, I should uh, share with you that um, the SCEA, South Carolina Education Association, uh, which was founded in 1881. As a matter of fact, it's uh, 140th birthday comes up this August 9, August 9, was predominantly white. Of course, we were segregated by race and separated by law. The predominantly black teachers association, which uh, was founded in 1900 as the Palmetto Education Association, the PEA, and then uh, some years later for a, a period of about 35 years, renamed itself the Palmetto State Teachers Association before going back to PEA. Ex they coexisted for uh, at least since 1900. SCEA founded in 1881, PEA in 1900. 
when Jimmy Burns was first elected and became governor in January of 1951, he did two things within his first 90 days in office. Uh, the first of which Dr. Green has already pointed out to you, he appointed the Gresset Commission, or more pointedly, he appointed the Segregation Commission to be chaired by Senator Marion Gresset. Now in uh, Dr. Green's slide, I saw the reference that the, uh, that the Gresset Commission exist existed from 1951 to 1956. In fact, I'll send to you, Dr. Green, some uh, coverage that shows the, uh, the Segregation Commission was appropriated, got appropriations from the legislature all the way up into the late 1960s, in part because they were, um, they were the subject of various lawsuits from NAACP and other organizations and had to defend themselves, and the legislature funded their defense. Um, so he appointed the Gresset Commission, and in March of 1951, he spoke to SCEA. Again, it wasn't yet the SCEA because it had not yet united with PEA. In those days, it was still called SCEA. In March, he spoke to SCEA, and in that uh, speech, he referred to a number of the themes that Dr. Green has already pointed out. He started out by defending the need for a sales tax for equalization purposes, first by laying on thick the issue of illiteracy among South Carolinians, that, uh, that most South Carol a lot of South Carolinians were illiterate, so we had to improve the quality of schools. And, uh, and at the same time, you've got this uh, business coming up with the Clarendon case. I find in his speeches, he doesn't refer ever to Briggs v. Elliott or Briggs. He always calls it the Clarendon case. So he says, we've got to issue a sales tax. The plan has already been developed by Representative Ernest Hollings and the Hollings Committee to issue bonds for $75 million. And to pay for that, we're gonna raise the sales tax. He even points out that uh, he understands that this is gonna fall disproportionately hard on black citizens in South Carolina. But he says, they are asking for better schools and better transportation facilities. And I'm confident that they'll be willing to help pay for those benefits. Later in that same speech too, keep in mind, he's speaking to white teachers in the SCEA in uh, March of 1951. He gets right quickly to the Clarendon case. He, uh, he says last fall after the election of this legislature, some Negroes who had brought a suit against Clarendon County asking for equal facilities abandoned that suit, but they instituted a new suit asking that the provisions of our constitution and statutes requiring separate schools for the races be held unconstitutional. I assume these people were inspired by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People because the president had asked the court to abolish segregation. They adopted that course instead of asking for equal facilities. The races, he says, are separated in the schools of 17 states as well as DC, which is under the jurisdiction of the Congress. I shall ask those 17 states to file briefs supporting our position that the court should uphold the doctrine of separate but equal facilities instead of ordering that segregation be abolished. But then he turns to what will happen if the argument, now keep in mind, this is 51. This is three years before the decision is made. What will happen if the argument goes against South Carolina and segregation? He said, should the Supreme Court decide against our position, we will face a serious problem. Of only one thing can we be certain, South Carolina will not now, nor for some years to come, mix white and colored children in our schools. Shades of uh, Strom Thurmond's speech in 1948. In the reconstruction days, he goes on, a carpetbag government tried to do it and failed. A democratic administration cannot now do what a Republican administration could not then do. If the court changes what is now the law of the land, we will, if it is possible, live within the law, preserve the public school system, and at the same time, maintain segregation. If that is not possible, reluctantly, we will abandon the public school system. To do that would be choosing the lesser of two great evils. He goes on then to paint this horrible portrait of what will happen if we abandon the public school system, all because NAACP and these people down in Clarendon County uh, have uh, a case before the court. What will happen? He, he's, he describes how we will sell the public school buildings statewide 
the $40 million that taxpayers spend annually on public education and that day will be turned back to them because we won't be collecting those taxes for that purpose. So with the tax money that they will keep in their pockets, they will open private schools for white students because they will be able to afford to. White private schools for white children. Parochial schools, uh, Catholic schools already operate Catholic schools, he says, for, the ch for Catholic children. Perhaps other denominations will do the same now. He says, ultimately, if the court rules against segregation, Blacks will suffer in South Carolina, and it won't be our fault. It'll be their fault. That was in 1951. Fast forward three years later to March of 1954. He comes back to speak to the state convention of SCEA, again, meeting in Columbia. This is a month before, two months, two months, maybe six, seven weeks before the board rules in Brown v. Board. So he comes back to them and he, he sort of uh, unspools this litany of uh, successes of his administration when it comes to uh, what they've been able to do in public education. All of the money that's been raised by the sales tax that was raised in 1951, the bonds that were issued, all of the buildings that have been built for the purposes of equalizing schools, the, uh, the school buses that have been purchased across the state. And he summarizes all of that by saying that um, uh, where's the line? Substantial equality with white pupils has been attained. Substantial equality uh, with white pupils has been attained. However, then he turns his attention again. This is 54. He turns his attention again to the Clarendon case. When I spoke to you in March 51, I referred to the school segregation case in Clarendon County, which at that time had not been argued in court. I tried to impress you and the people of our state with the seriousness of the problem. At that time, there was in our state constitution a provision that the General Assembly should provide a free public school for all children between six and 21 years of age. That provision has now been repealed. Now the constitution at this point, I'm stepping away from his comments, no longer had a constitutional requirement that the state provide public education for all of its children. They'd taken that off the books. There is another provision, he says, in our Constitution that separate schools shall be provided for children of the white and colored races, and no child of either race shall ever be permitted to attend a school provided for children of the other race. I am sworn to uphold that Constitution. I have tried to discharge my duty under that oath. He goes on in that same speech too. keep in mind these white teachers that what he said three years ago was misinterpreted by NAACP and their liberal lawyers. He says, I was misrepresented. He goes sentence by sentence. I said this, this is how they spun it. I said that, this is how they spun it. He then pivots to a litany of basically, I've been so good to these people in South Carolina, these black people in South Carolina. We've spent X, we've done Y, we've given them these many buses, we've built these many schools, et cetera, et cetera. He then pivots finally to arguing basically the Briggs versus Elliott case in front of these white teachers as if he were arguing before the Supreme Court. He points out the ratio that Dr. Green already referred to in the Clarendon County School District where this litigation arose, there are 2,657 Negro students, only 294 white students. That's nine to one. We know that if in District 3, white children are forced into a class with 27 Negroes, it would not improve the education of either the Negro or the white children. And that would be true where the school population is more equally divided. Instead of thinking about mathematics, children would be thinking of race relations. Racial conflict between children would result in conflict between parents. I fear that hatred and discord would supplant the peaceful relations that now exist. By our sacrifices, he says, we have proved, we white people, have proved our devotion to the public schools. Our present system of public schools is dear to us, but the preservation of racial integrity is even dearer. An adverse decision by the Supreme Court would present the most serious problem that has confronted this generation. Unless we find a legal way 
of preventing the mixing of races in the schools. It will mark the beginning of the end of civilization in the South as we have known it. To protect that civilization, we must depend upon ourselves. I said we must depend upon ourselves, but that is not right. We must not do that. We must also ask for divine guidance. We must earnestly pray. Now, he left office in January of 1955, but before leaving office, as I mentioned, he delivered this last address to the, uh, to the state legislature. But in between that, he went and spoke to a group of teachers in Spartanburg. Now, I've not determined to my own satisfaction that it was the SCEA affiliate in Spartanburg, but it was a group of teachers in Spartanburg. And in that speech, he, uh, he unspooled further a litany that uh, I'll share with uh, those of you. If you're interested, he unspooled uh, all that he's done for, uh, for education in public uh, schools in the state. But in this, he makes a fascinating point. He says, South Carolina is no longer the poorest member of the family of states. We are able to provide compensation for teachers equal to that of neighboring states, and we should do it. So those of you who are teachers or married to teachers or support teachers, y'all have to use Jimmy Burns' rhetoric when you can. In the last speech that he delivers to the legislature, January 12th of 1955, he makes uh, these last two or three points, and I'll be quick, because it's funny what he does. Keep in mind, the, the, the Supreme Court already ruled in March of 54 to issue its ruling in Brown v. Board, but as Dr. Green pointed out, they've not yet uh, issued their implementation order, and he now hangs his hat on, well, what it all comes down to, it all depends upon how the Supreme Court implements the decision that they made last year. He says, if they treat it like every other case, as they ought to, they will send an order back to the uh, district court in South Carolina to decide how it will be implemented. Of course, that's not how it happened in the end, but that's the, uh, the case that he makes to uh, the legislature, not teachers, but to the legislature. He says, in, this, in the last part, the rhetorical trick that he uses in the last part of this speech. In this state, we have 7,295 Negro teachers receiving equal pay with white teachers for equal service. Most Negroes are proud of their race and its accomplishments. The great majority of Negro parents prefer that their children should attend our modern schools for Negroes and be taught by Negro teachers. I believe that they will attend their own schools unless they are coerced by politicians of other states. Whether I'm right or wrong will be determined upon the implementation of the Supreme Court decision. If, oh, this is the beauty of it. If Negroes should then desert their colored teachers and seek to attend white schools, and as a result, our public school system be endangered, the responsibility for that tragedy will rest upon them and not upon you. Uh, so those, uh, that's a, a reference, that's a, a reading from, a selected reading from uh, some of Jimmy Burns' uh, speeches. And then uh, as uh, I think Brett may touch on some of the uh, solutions that came out of the Gresset Committee, the Segregation Committee, over the next several years uh, were draconian indeed. They did uh, eliminate the uh, constitutional provision for public schools statewide, and, uh, and they did a whole bunch of other things too. Um, I will point out that one thing that came out of the Gresset Committee was the invention, the first time, for the first time, the invention of the concept of vouchers for private schools, and in fact, tuition tax credits as well. And a footnote of history is that one of the first persons in Orangeburg County to apply for and be approved for a voucher to attend a brand new private school in Orangeburg County created in the 1960s, early 1960s to serve white children fleeing uh, what would ultimately become integrated schools was the niece of Senator Marion Gresset. Uh, Senator Marion Gresset had a couple of uh, important brothers, important because one of them became the, uh, the, the head football coach at the Citadel for many years. And when he could not any longer coach football, they decided he was uh, qualified to run the state retirement system. So they gave him a, a terrific patronage job. But another brother of his had a daughter whose name was Elizabeth Gresset, who went on in 1976 nine years after the white SCEA and the black PEA 
united to become the SCEA. Nine years after that merger was finished, April 1 of 1967, Elizabeth Gresset, niece of Marion Gresset, founded an organization called Palmetto State Teachers Association to give educators in South Carolina a choice. If you don't want to be a part of that integrated over, uh, organization over yonder, if you don't want to be a part of the politically active educators of the state who are trying to elect pro-public education politicians in South Carolina, come on over here. That concludes my report. Dr. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you, Cecil. Cecil is an absolute treasure uh, here in South Carolina. And y'all get his email address and wear him out because he really knows his stuff. And that um, a couple points I wanted to make was that um, that white teachers association that stole the name of the black teachers association, the Palmetto State Teachers Association. I didn't know their linkage back to, well, I knew that, that they were the white group, but what they are now perceived as the anti-union group. And they do all they can to trash the union, the SCEA, which is associated with the NEA, National Education Association. Um, they do all they can to blame the problems of schools on the teachers. And it's just this, you, you need to know this. And one of the other points that I think is really salient that has been one of my kind of crosses to bear is like the chicken little pointing out this horrible thing that's happening is that when Gresset is, not Gresset, when Burns is talking about closing the schools instead of integrating them, that was in the early 50s. And uh, I, it was Obama was president and there was a digital divide and everybody had to get the little boxes to put on their television because there was more spectrum left over when they crunched the signals. Gilda handed me a folder. She's on the joint bond review committee, which oversees all sales and acquisitions of the state property. And she said, look into this. And it was the disposition of ETV's excess capacity because of the digital combination and that whatever year that was, Cecil, tell me if you know, but that the, um, the I, I, I was the only person for in this room with uh, regular meetings for months and months and months about getting rid of this excess capacity that SCETV has on educational broadband, educational broadcasting system. And so when I looked into it, the first thing I realized was South Carolina owns all 63 licenses of educational broadcasting. Oh, the state that owns the next most is Mississippi with 75%. Oh, when did this happen? And you look in the newspaper when it happened and the headlines in 1959 are legislature debates closing public schools, legislature opens public television. So we have the nation's best public television system. Still that the legislature gave away rather than let the students use it. And I argued before the, the committee, it brought in experts from Washington, et cetera, about how we could, we could provide all half a million students that have free lunch because they don't have any money, a password to utilize the educational broadcast system that we own. This is the only state that owns all of the licenses, all controlled by the legislature through ETV that we can let all the kids have that for free because we know who they are because they're already qualified for the federal lunch program. And the, the chairman at the time, Harvey Peeler, the dairy farmer from Cherokee said, Mr. Bursey, that would be socialism. And God forbid we'd be socialistic towards teaching our children. And so now we, we could have been number one in the nation in having free statewide broadband because we're the only state that the people own a free statewide broadband system with 63 licenses and 1,000 towers, but we can't let them use it because that would be competing with AT&T. The University of South Carolina is still paying AT&T close to a million dollars a year for Wi-Fi on campus. We showed that they could do that for less than 50,000 a year. So that's, we're still climbing up out of using the racial issue with the issue for private private profit and combining those two things to serve the interest of rich white people. Cecil? I had one more footnote. Um, 
this uh, falls into the category of Faulkner's quote, the past is not past, it's, uh, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Um, if there happen to be any persons on the call tonight who are older than 70 years old, the Gresset's um, Segregation Commission was founded 70 years ago yesterday. So in your lifetime, 70 years ago yesterday, the Segregation Commission was founded. Robert, take it back. All right. So um, again, great job, Cecil, with the equalization material there. That was really important, I think, to, to really detailing what's going on in the state during this time period. Um, and before we get to talking about Isaac Woodard, which is what we're going to finish up with this evening, I do want to make some quick mention of some of the other civil rights and human rights campaigns going on in South Carolina at the end of World War II. Um, because again, it shows how much was lost in the state by the early to mid 1950s. So in, in 1944 and 45, you do have folks like Majeska Simpkins, for example, working on what's called, um, I'll just put this in the chat, uh, the Richland County uh, Citizens Commission, uh, Committee, excuse me. Um, now, this was part of a larger, will eventually become a larger movement of South Carolina citizens committees, which were basically organizations that were in the parlance of the era, they were almost like shadow organizations of the NAACP. Simpkins herself acknowledged in 1944-45 and, and moving forward that for many African Americans who wanted to join the NAACP or wanted to support the civil rights movement of that era, they had to do so very carefully, as we've seen with the Briggs v. Elliott case. And so there was this idea that Simpkins and others had to create some sort of like shadow committee, basically, that could do some of these things that the NAACP publicly was going to have a difficult time uh, doing. And I, I'll, just, I'll read you an excerpt. This is actually from a 1976 oral history that Majestica Simpkins did with Jacqueline Dowd Hall. Um, and I think Brett's probably read this before too or heard it before too, but Simpkins in 76, she talks about why they did this. And I'll just quote her directly. Um, let's see. And there were a number of, quote, and there were a number of people who were sympathetic with the moves of the NAACP and wanted to cooperate. But they knew that if their names were known, their positions in schools and other jobs would be jeopardized. So the plan was hit upon to set up a parallel organization for the NAACP, which we call the South Carolina Citizens Committee. It was organized here in Richland County in May 1944. And so you keep in mind that that's around the same time that the Progressive Democratic Party is also getting off the ground in South Carolina as well. And so you're seeing a lot of efforts by, by Black South Carolinians to try almost every method under the sun of organizing in order to find some cracks in the Jim Crow system. Now this kind of organizing would actually pay off in 1945-46 with the Charleston <coughs> Cigar Factory strike in which you had attempts by uh, labor leaders in Charleston, uh, black and white, to try to organize an effort to increase wages and, and make better working conditions at the, cigar, at the cigar factory in Charleston. Now, to make a long story short, the timing of this is really important. Again, coming as it does on the heels of World War II. And what's, and I put this in the, in the chat as well, there is a great um, resource from the Low Country Digital History Initiative about the cigar factory strike. And, and, I, and I hope you take some time to look at it because that's some great tools and resources there available for everyone to use. Um, but what happens during this strike is that some of the demands that the workers have of higher wages, et cetera, are actually met, but this is only after a, a months long campaign, which is not just local in nature, but is going to bring in labor organizers and the labor movement and civil rights movement, more broadly speaking, from across the country to look at what's going on in Charleston and to provide aid and support to the strike in Charleston. By the way, if you're not already familiar with the state's history, this will not be the last time there'll be a strike in Charleston that will bring the attention of the nation and the world. 
just a little bit of a spoiler alert for some classes down the road. But in 1945-46, coming as this does right after World War II, coming as it does with the PDP and with the citizens committees working overtime in South Carolina to push for substantial change, things like the cigar factory strike become incredibly important. And they also become important to the civil rights movement, broadly speaking. Some of the folks who are involved in Charleston eventually go to the Highland Folk School in Tennessee. And they, they take some of the lessons they learned from their movement efforts in Charleston and bring them with them to the Highland Folk School. Funny enough, arguably the biggest legacy of the strike is not the strike itself, it may not even be the wages that were won as a result of the strike. It may not even be the lesson of interracial cooperation. It might be a song. So there has been some argument amongst historians, but most folks believe that during 1945, during the strike in Charleston, some of the folks there on the picket lines began singing a song uh, that was titled, uh, We Will Overcome. Now, some of the folks who go to the Highlander Folk School the following year begin teaching this song to other activists at the school. And some of the lyrics were changed around and some of the wording has changed, shifted a little bit, um, and the song becomes, We Shall Overcome. So the anthem of the civil rights movement, the song that was sung not just in the Deep South, but would be sung in South Korea in the 1980s, would be sung in South Africa in the 1990s, a song that has come to embody the spirit of fighting for human freedom and dignity, We Shall Overcome, actually has its origins in Charleston, South Carolina, thanks to this cigar factory strike in 1945. Um, of course, when the song is often mentioned, that part of the story, of the song story is often conveniently left out. And I think you're probably seeing a pattern here of how the state of South Carolina has made such a huge difference in civil rights activism, not just in the South, not just in the country, but around the world, but often does not get that credit. So this is what's going on in the mid 1940s. And, and now we wanna really talk about a, a pivotal event that would once again, get the state of South Carolina on the map for not the best reasons in the world. Robert, I wanna mention something about the South Carolina Citizens Committee before we move sure. on. That Majesco created the shadow organization um, to get around the oppression that was coming down on the, the uh, NAACP that really ratcheted up when we got into the 50s. And that, that you couldn't be a school teacher in South Carolina if you were a member of the NAACP, as I are you now or have you ever been a member of the NAACP? And that by that was, uh, to 50, uh, 53, 54, 55, 56, that's happening. Majeska gets blackballed from the NAACP state conference that she started because she's too militant and that she's like consorting with union people and known agitators and communists. And so that there was um, a cabal of black ministers within the NAACP that wanted to push her out. They left her name off a ballot for uh, office. She was the executive state secretary. And she clearly had a profile that was higher than any of the men in the thing at the time and was really out there in the field doing the work. And so Majeska started, and she gets iced, and she starts the Richland County Citizens Committee. So when I met her and got hooked up with her and she was working with the grassroots organizing workshop and being our advisor, we're helping her in the mid seventies. She was organizing as the Richland County Citizens Committee. And it took me years when we started the Jessica School to figure out how that, how that happened. And that when she was doing the Richland County Citizens Committee, she was kind of on her own doing statewide organizing on a more kind of militant footing than the NAACP was. And if you read Becky's book, which I hope all of you got in the mail, if you didn't get one, send me an email and we'll mail you one about Majeska. Uh, you'll understand that, that Ms. Simpkins towed the line uh, and, and stayed true to her principles. And she paid her NAACP dues even after they threw her out so she could raise hell with them. And so that's, that's something that... Uh, we all need to be mindful of. And Robert, take it, where are we going now? 
So we're going to now do, um, I think I want to talk a bit about Isaac Woodard um, and his role and the role of his beating in the, the broader civil rights narrative. Well, I'm, I, I can pick that up because I, uh, I didn't know about Isaac, Isaac Woodard until we started looking into why the 1946 Southern Negro Youth Congress convention was in Columbia, South Carolina. And, and as you learn about that conference and as you read the things that we've passed out and all, you realize it was an international event. Well, and I, I've just spent a long time trying to figure out how did that happen? And the, the, when I, the way that I discovered it was really interesting in that we started the Majeska School in, 19, in 2015, not 1915, while our offices were in Majeska's house at, at 2025 Marion Street. And we, we were looking at figuring out how to you know, help people be organizers and to learn South Carolina history. We certainly had been um, students, longtime students of Howard Zinn's methodology of teaching the people's history. See, the people's history is taught not by the people that win, but by the people that fight back and, and basically get beaten and keep fighting. And so it's the resistance, the, the history of resistance. And um, I was involved at the university in, I think it was 1968 or nine, when we had Howard Zinn as a, as a speaker. And Howard uh, Zinn passed away, I think maybe two years ago, but he, the Zinn Project, Google Zinn Project, and go and see what they're doing. And on a national scale, looking at US history, that's what we're doing with South Carolina history. And that the, um, the work that we were doing to try and dig up the history started pe pulling up these things. Then uh, Isaac Woodward was one of them. And that the, the work that Majeska did with the Southern Negro Youth Congress was another one. But we talk about Isaac Woodard because that was one of the things that was early in 1946. So I'm trying to figure out why is this conference this? bell ringing international conference in Columbia, South Carolina in October 1946 in the township auditorium with black and white people at a time when it's illegal for black and white people to be on the, on the grounds there together. And that there was an overflow crowd. It only holds like 3,200 people or 5,000 people turned out. There was delegations from South Africa, South America. W.E.B. Du Bois gave the keynote. Paul Robeson sang. And that this is a remarkable event. In February, Isaac Woodard is blinded in uniform, coming back from World War II as a soldier on his way home to Winsboro. And he's pulled off a bus because he asked the bus driver to wait for him so he could go to the bathroom in Batesburg. And that the, the bus driver gets an attitude about this black guy telling him that he needs to wait on him. He calls the cops. And they come and they arrest Woodard, poke his eyeballs out in, in, in custody, and he wakes up the next day blind for life. And so the Isaac Woodard story kind of lost, you know, it, it didn't get a whole lot of ink then, but in April of that year, Orson Welles discovers it. Orson Welles is like the nation's number one kind of like, uh, well, there's no television, right? In, but the media star, and he has a national NBC program, uh, weekly program that he's doing, and he does four segments on the blinding of Isaac Woodard, which are listed in the class four study guide that you have access to through our website. You can listen to these things that Orson Welles does. Very, very powerful. And, um, and so that was in, blind was in February. Late, followed by Orson Welles doing the national broadcasting, raising the, raising the profile of what's happening in South Carolina. At the same time, there's initiatives going on to prevent white-only primaries. And the Supreme Court has ruled against white-only primaries in Texas and Georgia. South Carolina is the last state with white-only primaries. We'll get to that in a minute. And so... There, there was a fundraiser um, for Isaac Woodard and I think it was in August in Manhattan that was in a stadium there 
that I found out about as we're digging into this. And like the stadium's packed. There's 10,000 people outside. There's 30,000 people that turn out for a concert by the, the A-listers of, the, of um, entertainment at the time. Um, Billy Holiday, Milton Berle, and other people that were coming out and supporting Isaac Woodard. Isaac Woodard came on and spoke and that the um, that they raised, I think it was like some, that ten or eleven thousand dollars. It was enough for Isaac to buy his his mother and family a home. And so this is becoming a national cause celeb about violent Jim Crow racism in the South and in South Carolina in particular. And then the kind of the next thing that was happening was that August was a Supreme Court hearing on the white only primaries in South Carolina. It was the last ones, 1944, it was two years earlier, the Supreme Court had struck down Texas and they struck down Georgia. And NANA South Carolina didn't call special sessions of the legislature and change 200 laws and references to the South Carolina Democratic Party or just party operations is being legally, legally governed by the state and they changed the South Carolina Democratic Party into a public party. And excuse me, a private party. They changed it kind of like we did with the, the alcohol drinking is that if you if you had a, a club or fraternity that wanted to drink, you'd become a private club and you could do it. So they changed the, the Democratic Party into a private club to keep black people from voting. And so that case, Elmore v. Elmore v. Elmore v. Elmore v. Elmore v who, Robert? Elmore, Elmore v. v. Rice. Elmore v. Rice. That was in 46 in August. So all these things are happening and the attention of the world is now focusing on South Carolina. Literally, there were people, it was literally around the world was the Isaac Hayes thing, Isaac Woodard, excuse me, and that the, um, the, the um, fight against the white-only primaries was a national, an international issue. And so that's what brought the Southern Negro Youth Congress conference to Columbia, South Carolina in October 1946. And what we found in, in, in doing this research, we started the school in 2015. And it, and it was, wasn't until 2016 that I really kind of snapped to the significance of the Southern Negro Youth Congress that Majesco is a senior organizer for. And we're going to have next Monday the, the, the doctor um, that wrote the book, the PhD professor that wrote the book called Death Blow to Jim Crow, that's about the National Negro Youth Congress, which, which was the older adult segment and the, the formation of the Southern Negro Youth Congress, which started after the National Negro Youth Congress um, with A. Philip Randolph and other people that Majeska had worked with during the, uh, the New Deal. And that the Dr. Gelman is gonna be speaking He's our deep dive person next Wednesday. So we're going to get deeply into the, the, what was gained and what was lost, what was found and what we need to recover with the work that was a multiracial class conscious movement that got snuffed out. And so that the, the, uh, the conference in 46 that Majeska helped put on at the Township Auditorium was absolute bell ringer, an internationally acclaimed event and, but it was pretty much the last thing that they did that it was high profile. But I'm going to I'm going to save the, the what happened in Birmingham in 1948 when Bull Connor was the the uh, the sheriff of the of the town there uh, to, for the next uh, meeting we have with Dr. Gilman, and just speak about us understanding me understanding the um, the fact that our Majesca School was started and. and in Majeska's house at 2025 Marion Street. And uh, if you have the book that Becky wrote that we mailed everyone, um, you'll see in there um, a reference to Majeska starting a leadership training school in 1946 that is doing the same thing we're doing now that we didn't know about, I didn't know about. And I was with Majeska for the last like 18 plus years of her life I didn't know about that. The, the fact that something that profound happened in Columbia, South Carolina, what we did in 2016, that we, we had the 70th anniversary of that event at the Township Auditorium. And we invited, uh, Dr. Gelman came, um, and a fellow that I had met at a meeting in 
Tulane, at Tulane University in New Orleans, where I was meeting with executive directors of voting rights organizations in early 2016. And that I've been talking to these executive directors of voting rights in the South, and we're all tired, and we've all been toting this load for a long time and rolling the rock up the hill. And I said, let me tell you that what my, what my mentor told me, she said, people ask her, how do you keep doing this decade after decade? And I said, well, she said, well, I guess I'm selfish because it makes me feel good. And after the meeting was over with this fellow came up to me and he's a, a PhD professor at um, uh, Middle State Tennessee College, Sekou Franklin. And he said, I know who your mentor was. And I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I did my PhD study on the 1946 Southern Negro Youth Congress in Columbia. And Dr. Franklin gave me, I think it was hundreds and hundreds of pages of the FBI record on that conference. And so we now know where the people were from, the 400 students from South Carolina, uh, the, the 156 white delegates. So we know from the FBI what we hadn't read and Gelman's book um, captures a lot of that. But this is like right here, right home as to why all the things that we've been talking about, we don't learn because history is written by the winners to sustain their winning. And so that, that our school is now standing on these forgotten shoulders that we're digging up and understanding. And it's really a wonderful heritage that we've inherited. Uh, but it's also rather depressing that we're fighting the same fight because the, the, the program that we have from the first school, the leadership training school that, that I'm aware of, uh, Graham Duncan, who was helping us start the school. Graham is uh, one of the operatives at the South Carolina Museum, which is where all good things about the past politics goes uh, to reside. Uh, Graham went to uh, Howard and the University Archives and dug up the letter from Ms. Simpkins to the, uh, to the citizens uh, of Columbia. And I'm gonna try and share my screen now if I can do this without um, confusing everyone. But this is the letter that Majeska wrote. No, Robert, nod your head if you can see this. Okay. This is the letter she wrote from 2025 Marion Street in 1946. We were in her house 70 years later planning a school to do that which it is that she said needed to be done 70 years before we did it. It must be conceded at this very hour, more than at any time in the history of this nation, there's an urgent need for the development of progressive thinkers to become the leaders of tomorrow. The leadership training school is planned to do just that. And she, so she's, she's pitching that which it is that we were pitching 70 years later for the same reason we're pitching it. And that the uh, other, other document was this, this is the brochure. You see this, Robert? Yes. That the, it was printed in 1946. Harbison, everybody that lives in Columbia knows Harbison is like a, a, um, um, basically a, a shopping center and a, a housing complex. But there is a school there that was a black school you know, with a tremendous history of being run out of uh, upstate South Carolina by the Klan. And they were uh, acquired a good deal of uh, property uh, right outside of, of Columbia. It was now a lot of it's Harbison State Forest and the Harbison complex. So Harbison Junior College, it was a 10 day residential program for young black people and um, each application had to be uh, accompanied by a $5 deposit and your deposit would be returned if you're not accepted. And so there's the application that you had to fill out as to what it was. And then here's the, here's the list of things that they're, they're studying. They're talking about winning elections, defending civil rights, world affairs and the fight for peace, the job program for youth of the South, education of democracy. Um, that this is, this is an indication of the things that we're still fighting for are not here yet. And that the, um, the, the Becky has um, observed and has written some things about the, the prescient nature of the students, that the things that we've read that she's got, that we've read about the students, they were just so involved and so focused on the work that they were doing and spending time in the school and building comrades. 
And there were 11 chapters, I believe, that Majeska started in South Carolina of the Southern Negro Youth Conference that at some point, I'm hoping that we can get people in the, in the school that want to go out and talk to these people in these towns like Monk's Corner and find out, does anybody, we, we know some of the names of the people that were the leaders then, find their relatives, just kind of dig up these roots and stir things up in these other places that need to know their own history. And so that's, I think, pretty much what I've got to say about the, uh, the history of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Um, the Orson Welles uh, radio clips are online uh, and in your study guide. And that, um, I think that'll do it, Robert. I'm going to save, save some of the good stuff for Dr. Gelman. If you take it back and uh, take us home, we've got another 30 minutes. We need some time for questions. Sure. And, and before we get to the Q&A session, which I do want to get to, I do want to very briefly talk about a one last topic that I think also helps to explain why the civil rights and, and broader progressive movements in the 40s come to a screeching halt by the early 1950s. Of course, a big part of that is the Second Red Scare, which is part and parcel of the global Cold War. Um, but the thing about the Red Scare is that in the late 1940s, many Americans who had any association whatsoever with communism or socialism were essentially run out of public life through a variety of different methods. For example, uh, some of you may have heard of the Lavender Scare of the late 1940s and 50s, where folks who were what we now call the LGBTQ community who worked in the State Department and other parts of the federal government lost their jobs because they were gay or lesbian, but it was they were basically being tied to communists and, and communism. And the threat at the time was, well, if they're gay or lesbian, and obviously they can be manipulated by the communists, which was absolute bunk. Um, thousands of Americans lost their jobs in the federal government because of that. Uh, folks like Paul Robeson and W.B. Du Bois were ostracized by polite society, by the public writ large. Um, du Bois at one point actually loses his passport in the early 1950s. He and Robeson, both become persona non grata by the early 1950s because they were both sympathetic to communism and to the Soviet Union. Enter into this, and I want to bring these, these things together. Of course, you have Hollywood blacklisting as well going on, the Hollywood 10, for example. But I want to bring all these topics together. What's going on in South Carolina? What's going on with the Cold War? What's going on with the Second Red Scare with the election of 1948? Because you do see in 1948 all of these themes we've discussed this evening, segregation in the South, the progressive movement across the country, uh, the concern over the Cold War abroad and the color line abroad too, all coming to a head in this 1948 election. And I'm gonna just spend a few minutes to cover this and then we'll proceed directly into our Q and A. Um, now, the thing about the, the South in the late 1940s, as I've said it before and, and I'll say it again, is that there are some white Southerners who are trying to find ways to, again, ex expose a more moderate viewpoint of segregation. You do see this in the aftermath of another tragedy in South Carolina, the lynching of Willie Earl in 1947, which takes place a year after the Isaac Woodard be beating. In this case, uh, what happens is that um, essentially a cab driver is found killed, found murdered, uh, Willie Earl is, is blamed for the murder, uh, and very quickly he is, of course, uh, assaulted by a white mob. Uh, he's, he's murdered by this mob. But what makes this lynching different from other lynchings in, in the history of the South is that it was actually prosecuted. And while the prosecution failed, right, ultimately dozens of folks are, are tied to the, the lynching in some form or fashion, many of them actually admit to being there for the lynching and planning it out and take pride in that. And a jury of their peers after five hours of deliberation decides they're not guilty, they're all acquitted. What the lynching case does do is it does launch into prominence the newly elected governor of South Carolina in 1947, Strom Thurmond. Now Thurmond himself at this point had already been involved in state politics in the 30s and 40s. He had served in the Second World War and in 1947, he actually aggressively prosecutes this case as governor because he wants to show the country that the South is actually willing to be a region for law 
and order. That's the language that Thurman and others are using. Thurman's basically saying, we can't allow lynch mobs to continue to dominate our politics. What's implicit in that, of course, is Thurman is also saying, we're gonna to have to find other methods by which to enforce white supremacy and Jim Crow segregation. Lynch mobs are from the old days. We can't do that anymore. But we are still going to proclaim the color line as being paramount in the South. We're just gonna do it through the legal system. Now, by 1948, of course, the Democratic Party has basically been torn apart over the issue of race. Um, I mentioned in, in class three that the New Deal coalition of Franklin Roosevelt is on incredibly shaky ground, depending on black voters in the North to support it, along with white Southern voters to support it as well. With black voting strength, gain, strength getting in the North and with the civil rights movement gaining strength across the country, by 1948, President Harry Truman is being pushed by the liberal wing of the Democratic Party to support more civil rights initiatives. Uh, this is going to lead, of course, to the segregation of the armed forces in 1948, but also at the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia, it will lead to a massive walkout by many, not all, but many Southern Democrats who later reconvene in Alabama to form the state's rights party, aka the Dixiecrats. And of course, on the right-hand side of the screen, you do see the Time Magazine from 1948, a cover showing Strom Thurmond, who would, of course, become a nominee of president of the Dixiecrats. Um, again, one of uh, four parties that will run someone for president that year. Of course, the Democrats run Harry Truman. Uh, the Republicans um, also run a candidate for office as well. Um, and of course, whose name I now have forgotten at this very moment of talking about it. But then the progressive party, oh, Thomas Dewey. Um, who's a Republican nominee. And then the Progressive Party runs Henry Wallace, who was at one point FDR's vice president before he was kicked off the ticket in 1944. Now, the state's rights party, of course, led by Thurman and Fielding, J, uh, Fielding L. Wright of Mississippi, the state's rights party knows they cannot actually win the presidential election. That's not their goal. Their goal is to win enough electoral votes in the South to force the election to go to the House of Representatives. As you might know from your civics lessons, um, the Constitution does have a provision if no one wins a majority electoral votes in the aftermath of the presidential election. Essentially, the election goes to the House where each state delegation to, the co to Congress votes for president. Their goal was to force the election to Congress to then receive concessions from the rest of the country to essentially put civil rights on the back burner for a generation, to ensure that the other parts of the country, including um, parts of the country that were more liberal, would basically stop agitating for civil rights in exchange for winning the White House. And again, if this sounds crazy, keep in mind that the Compromise of 1877 that ended Reconstruction was essentially a compromise built on the backs of maintaining and defending a white supremacist system in the South in exchange for the presidency. But this isn't the only third party in town in 1948. You've also got the Progressive Party, again, led by Henry Wallace in 1948, uh, which in the 48 election, many Americans actually associate with communism because partly because there are communists who are actually in the Progressive Party, and partly because the Progressive Party was the most left-wing of all the parties running a candidate for office that year. Um, the Progressive Party believed in these really crazy ideas like civil rights, for example, um, insane topics and, and suggestions like ensuring world peace, um, even really out-of-the-box ideas like universal health care. These were the kinds of things the Progressive Party stood for in 1948, and Henry Wallace's campaign was incredibly aggressive in pursuing this all across the country. They even hosted in the Deep South uh, integrated um, rallies and, and, and campaign events, again, designed to show what they believe to be the best of American society. Um, and yeah, I actually, I would agree that I think Henry Wallace may very well have been to the left of many so-called progressives today in a lot of ways. 
But the 1948 election and the Progressive Party's campaign becomes a rallying cry for many on the American left. Again, Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois support the campaign. In fact, in, in a footnote, as Cecil will put it, footnote to history, 1950, Du Bois himself actually runs for the Senate from New York as a Progressive Party candidate. Uh, again, showing how the Progressive Party was still lingering in the early 1950s, despite the Cold War and the Second Red Scare. But the Progressive Party also becomes a place where many younger activists get involved in activism, in politics, and so forth. And some of these folks you've heard of before, namely a very young Coretta Scott, uh, who in 1948 is a Progressive Party volunteer. Her introduction to politics um, and activism in many ways comes through the Progressive Party. And for the rest of her life, uh, Coretta Scott would, of course, argue that many of the things the Progressive Party believed in, like universal health care, uh, guaranteed employment, et cetera, those were the kinds of things that she steadfastly believed in and would fight for uh, alongside Martin Luther King Jr. and for decades after King's assassination in 1968. Again, spoiler alert, Coretta Scott King will make an appearance in her own right in South Carolina later in this class, extolling some of the virtues about labor rights and civil rights and gender rights that were first being talked about in the Progressive Party in 1948. In a lot of ways, the world that we live in today has still is being influenced by the Progressive Party. If you talk about a Bernie Sanders, for example, or other folks on the left, the Progressive Party represented many of those goals they wanted in the late 1940s. Unfortunately, thanks to the Second Red Scare, uh, thanks to the fact that the Democratic Party was incredibly afraid of being tarred as a pro-communist or at least a weak on the fence party, the Progressive Party uh, doesn't really muster enough strength to win a single state. But, but as, as we all know, electoral maps in American history can be a little misleading. The state's rights party does win several Southern states, including, of course, South Carolina, uh, voting for favored son, Strom Thurmond. But if you were to look nationally, the Progressive Party, although its votes spread out across the country, wins almost as many votes as the state's rights party does. Nonetheless, the Democrats draw from this that they are able to squeak out an election victory that most did not see coming, um, but after 1948, you don't really see a lot of movement in the early 1950s on civil rights, again, because of the Cold War, because President Truman and the Democratic Party, they're greatly concerned with the Second Red Scare, with communism. Keep in mind that in 1949, of course, China, um, Mao Zedong wins the Civil War against the nationalists in China, and mainland China becomes a communist nation and the like. That same year, in 49, the Soviet Union explodes the atomic bomb. And so, the foreign policy Truman administration, which becomes hardline anti-communist, really governs American foreign policy for decades to come. I say this because the Progressive Party represented a, a less militarist point of view. Uh, Wallace himself was adamant about trying to pursue peaceful relations with the Soviet Union. Of course, his arguments were weakened in the public sphere by concerns of communists being in his party, of actually controlling the Progressive Party, but it does show how hawkish the nation was by 1948 that both major parties were, the Democrats and Republicans, were pursuing a hardline against communism, and a third party, the state's rights party, is arguing that civil rights agitators were essentially communist agents. This is a political atmosphere in which it becomes very difficult to continue the kind of human rights work that folks like Majeska Simpkins folks in the, the original SNCC and the NNC and other organizations were so devoted to during and after World War II. It also explains why, we fast forward several generations, so many of these progressive movements on the ground in South Carolina and across the country have been reduced to being barely known about amongst most Americans. Really, these organizations are only well known amongst historians, amongst groups of activists, and that's really it. So when we all talk about the civil rights movement in the public sphere, talking about it in terms of how the public thinks about race relations now, 
there is a reason why we often start with Brown v. Board and not with Riggs v. Elliott and not with the PDP and not with the original SNCC and so on and so forth. Because if you start talking about human rights in the 30s and 40s, you start talking about what these activists wanted, then you get into the very uncomfortable territory of talking about labor rights, talking about healthcare and access to truly equal education. The kinds of topics that are seen in 2021 in our supp supposed progressive age, topics that are still seen as being almost forbidden to discuss and talk about amongst many politicians. Okay. And finally, I want to put this again in context of the Cold War era, how the Soviet Union and other communist nations are using what's going on in America, the, the using the Isaac Woodard a blinding, the Willie Earl lynching, using all these other events in America to tell the rest of the world that the United States, in fact, is not serious about civil rights. It is not serious about freedom. And what you see before you are, are posters and postcards that were distributed uh, throughout the third world, throughout the communist bloc, again, showing how many around the world are looking at the United States. In particular, look at the one on the left. Uh, I think this is a very striking image of the Statue of Liberty being used to lynch a black man. And so the federal government is at home trying not to rock the boat on civil rights, but abroad is trying to show that, hey, actually we are making some progress on civil rights. We are trying to make things better for our citizens of color, but it's certainly not an argument many in the deep South are willing to entertain. Um, and, and I will end, end this by, by telling a very quick story um, about a couple of folks, um, about one person from the state of Alabama. Um, although we are concerned mostly with South Carolina history, I think the story is, is rather interesting. So um, Angela Davis, uh, the great uh, activist, uh, scholar, um, writer, um, she grew up in Birmingham, Alabama in the 50s and 60s. And she has told a story on more than one occasion of she and her sister walking down the streets of Birmingham and seeing in, in a store window, a very nice pair of shoes. But of course, like many of the stores in downtown Birmingham at the time, the store was segregated. It was a whites only store. If you were black, you might be able to enter the back door, but that's about it. You certainly couldn't actually shop in the store and look at things. But then Davis, being a child of the Cold War era and the era of Third, War, Third World decolonization, hatched an idea in her head. And this was think, thanks partially to the education she received from Black teachers in Birmingham. She and her sister walked into the shoe store and astonished uh, patrons and shoe salesmen alike looked at them. And before they could say, what in the world are you two doing in here? Davis and her sister began speaking French. At that moment, everyone in the store treated Davis and her sister like they were the daughters of foreign dignitaries. Because in the deep South in the 50s and early 60s, you did have dignitaries from Africa and Asia traveling the region. And they actually would often go to restaurants and other stores. And these diplomats from, from Sub-Saharan African nations and the like would see up close segregation. And it was an embarrassing thing for the federal government to deal with time and time again that foreign dignitaries were treated as second class citizens because of the color of their skin. And so the Davises walk in the store, they begin speaking French. Uh, the, suit, the shoe salesmen fall over each other trying to sell these shoes to these two girls. And then the Davises get the shoes, they walk out of the store, and then outside of, of viewing distance of the folks in the store, begin laughing hysterically. Again, this is a, a comedic story, but it also reminds us of how insidious Jim Crow segregation was across the South, that it is not simply a system that oppressed folks in South Carolina or Alabama or across the South. It was a system that presented America, some would say at its worst, and others would say America at its most realistic. All right. so. Let's go ahead now and got time for a few questions. Robert, before we take questions, I want to say that we're, we're going to extend our shutoff time here 
past 8 30 and those that want to stay and talk stay and talk but those that leave i want you to to understand that this session next monday is going to reveal um an incident where uh henry wallace's vice presidential candidate in 1948 um was arrested in birmingham alabama after majeska invited him to come and speak and it was the last gasp of the Southern Eagle Youth Congress. It's an incredible story. So stay tuned, come back next Monday. And Robert, take questions as long as people want to stay and chat. Well, not as long as, but for a reasonable period of time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, you know, go ahead and, and, and whatever questions you might have, uh, please go ahead and, and post them. Um, I just love the Angela Davis story. I think it's a, a hoot, so I always love telling that story. But please, any any questions at all? Robert, can people raise their hand and say something as long as they're sure. brief? Go right ahead. Amber, please go ahead. So I have a question, understanding a little bit um, about what you're talking about, like the origins of how we got into um, the integration movement with the Briggs versus Elliot, how it first started with um, them just wanting accessibility to it being full on integrated in the schools. I was just trying to wonder what, where was the switch and or the change in strategy as far as shifting from, oh, I want more resources in our own schools to integrate it into uh, white mm. schools? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. And to answer your question, um, really, that, that switch is a gradual process and not everyone's on board with it at the same time. I'll give you an example. When in 1946, uh, there is a, a case where the NAACP is supporting John Wright and his attempt to segregate the law school at University of South Carolina. Now, the argument that was raised that comes before Judge Waring, as a matter of fact, was that there was no law school in the state for African-Americans. So they were required to have one. Now, what that looked like was the big question. Would it be desegregating USC's law school or as what would eventually happen, would it be building a separate all black law school? And option B was what the state government went with. Now, part of their reasoning in 1946 was that South Carolina State College was already ready to basically house a law school, which was somewhat true, but, but not entirely because needed a lot more funding and really, from 1947, 1966, the SC State Law School really performs way above its budgetary weight, so to speak, because it produces virtually every important black lawyer during the civil rights era in the state of South Carolina. But the SC State School president at the time was very much in favor of that separate law school because he and others in Orangeburg felt that it made the most sense to just have a law school that would be just for African Americans. Now, by the early 1950s, what you're seeing with the Briggs v. Elliott case is that when Judge Waring hears the case, he begins to encourage Thurgood Marshall and NAACP to transition from separate but equal as their primary aim to full desegregation. But it's never as though every Black activist in the South is fully on board with this, because if you look at some of the letters being exchanged among civil rights activists in 1953, 54, 55, some of them are actually saying, hey, if, if we do get full desegregation, what's going to happen to our schools? What's gonna to happen to black teachers, educators, black principals, et cetera? And what ends up happening is that many of them, as, as Dr. Brown mentioned last week, lose their jobs um, or they, they lose some of their salaries and that kind of thing. So, um, and, and to Chloe's point, I do apologize that, that Houston was not mentioned. Uh, this. Again, this is the joy of, of trying to cram so much into two hours. Um, I will say that Houston is, and first of all, Amber, to answer your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. So, uh, so Chloe, real quick, with, with Charles Hamilton Houston, um, and again, this is just for the sake of time, Houston is really the, the originator of this NAACP legal defense strategy in the 1930s. Uh, Houston himself was a graduate, uh, was actually, person in charge of Howard Law School in the 1930s. He eventually becomes a really important part of the NAACP. And he's really more so than anyone else in the organization trying to push the NAACP to try to find 
a legal strategy, a legal campaign to break the back segregation in the South and across the country. So a, a big part of what Thurgood Marshall is doing in the 40s and 50s is actually building on what Charles Hamilton Houston was talking about in the 30s and 40s and really trying to push through with some of the early Seth but equal cases involving uh, graduate schools and law schools in the 1930s and the World War II era. Okay, um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, Ian, your hand is raised. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, um, so to my knowledge, right, like the, the current private school efforts are realistically not any different from the his, historical ones, right? I'm just curious, like, like if if you could, um, can, can, like, tie that back, right? Because like the the current private school efforts that they're taking place in in South Carolina, right? They they want to make vouchers. They they want to make like this this whole um, system that benefits typically a lot of the more like upper class white population that has no bearing on uh, black people and their like well-being here, their educational status. And, and so what the like de, de facto nature is, is going to hear, right, is that the public schools are, are being designated for the poor students, the black students, right? And then, you know, um, but I, I'm, I'm just curious what, what your take on that is. Yeah, so there's, Oh, there's a lot that could be said about this. Um, and I, I think Cecil has, has talked a good bit about this as well. A, a big thing is that, well, there, there are a couple points I want to make right off the bat. Number one, um, you think about many of the private schools that are in South Carolina and really across the South today. Many of them actually began as what we now call, what we what we'll call in the 60s and 70s, segregation academies. They were schools that were Everyone, no one questioned what they're actually being built for. They're being built to accommodate white students from white families that did not want to accept the Brown v. Board decision, did not want to accept even the languishing attempts at desegregation in the 60s and 70s. Now, many of those academies today, people kind of see them as just simply private schools, but their histories going back to the 60s and 70s are very much as segregation academies. Um, I think also you add to that, and I posted this in the chat earlier this evening, but someone had asked a question about Black taxpayers, right, and, and their relationship to segregation efforts, to schooling and education, and what folks have found, historically speaking, is that Black taxpayers not only paying for segregated schools, they were often paying more in taxes than their white counterparts were for schools that did not have the same kind of equipment or technology or resources that their white counterparts did. And again, going back to Amber's question, a big concern amongst many black activists in the Deep South wasn't so much getting white or black students into white schools as it was making the black schools as well off financially in terms of resources, books, et cetera, as their white counterparts were. Uh, but certainly that legacy is still with us. You think about, for example, the corridor of shame in South Carolina today, this wide stretch of, of territory within the state where the schools are some of the worst in the nation. Many of those schools are majority black schools. And the funding that they receive is, is clearly not designed to help those students learn. Um, it's just piecemeal being given while the segregation academies that are still around today, they may have some you know, some people of color in their schools now, but those schools were founded with the express purpose of fending off desegregation at all costs. So, Robert, Robert, go let, me, you know, let me point out that, that, that in, in looking at it, that, that the segregation academies of the early 60s are, are still the schools of choice in the majority of black districts in the corridor. Fairfield County is a good example. They have one high school. There's only uh, like 17,000 voters in the whole county. There's one high school and it's 98 to 99% black. The um, white flight academy that was created in the 60s is where the white students go to school. And that we have in South Carolina across the board, 
um, funding by zip code. And so if you're in a poor zip code, your schools have less money. And so those two things go together to actually facilitate um, having the white middle class people leave the uh, public schools. Uh, Cecil, go ahead. I see your hands raised. I'd point out too that um, when you take a look at the membership of the segregation commission created in 1951 and that existed through the late 1960s, it was a quasi legislative, quasi private entity in that there were members of the legislature on it and then there were gubernatorial appointees from the business community on it as well. The fact that it was a legislative committee funded by the legislature, however, it gave them the right to go into executive session. However, uh, litigation in the 1960s proved that no minutes were ever kept, uh, so there was no availability of oversight. When you take a look at the, uh, the, bus the business membership on the, uh, the segregation committee, these were the men who in their own communities across the state wound up either founding or helping to raise money from other business uh, leaders in their communities to create these segregation academies uh, like the Robert E. Lee Academy. It's still called the Robert E. Lee Academy. It's a private school. Um, curiously and sort of comically to me, uh, if you take a look at these private academies websites today, you'll see photographs that are nearly lily white, but that have just a spot of color over in one place or another because uh, they want to uh, demonstrate that, no, we're not racist. We allow one little child in <laughs> who's not bright white like we are, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this um, change, uh, those of you who remember Tom Turnipseed, who just passed away a year or so ago, uh, may not know that he came to South Carolina in the late 1960s after running Henry Wallace's gubernatorial campaign in Alabama to go to work for the state's association of what was called independent schools. They didn't call themselves segregation academies, they called themselves independent schools. And his job working for that association was uh, basically as a cheerleader to go into communities and get business people to open these segregation academies. He very happily explained after his sort of conversion uh, later in the 1970s uh, that that's what he did and he felt terrible for having done it, et cetera, et cetera but was very effective during the years that he worked for that uh, association. In the early 1990s, when charter schools became uh, popular, uh, originally, you know, educators were in support of it, but as the business community, white business community, private school community got their, their talons into the charter school concept, now public charter schools themselves have turned into the publicly funded white private schools of the past. Yeah, and Cecil, Tom Turnipseed was one of our regular speakers until he passed. He started 32 white flight academies in 1963. And um, he was George Wallace's campaign manager nationally. Not George Henry Wallace. Wallace. Not, Henry. <laughs> not Henry Wallace. Not Henry. But uh, yeah, this, this, these are things that linger on, not really behind the scenes, but in a different cloak. And that um, I think that... Um, Deborah Billings mentioned the, the Hammond Academy, and it goes way back to having some um, foot, foothold in that white flight thing and has really tried to clean up his act, but Mr. Hammond has uh, other uh, hurdles to climb to get clear. Yeah, I see a couple of questions in the chat that have been there for a few minutes. Uh, one from Carrie is, what role did Allen University play in the movement in South Carolina in this time period? So there's... A couple of different things to say about that, of course, Allen University was a place where a lot of activists, especially younger activists, received training. Um, but in particular, in, in the late 1950s, you do have students from Allen. Again, this is a part of the larger civil rights campaign in the state of South Carolina in the late 1950s, which we'll talk more about in weeks to come. There are students from Allen who actually at one point in 1958 or 9, actually tried to apply for admission to the University of South Carolina in an attempt to force the issue of desegregation onto the state government and through the state university. Um, that effort, of course, doesn't really succeed, but it does show that younger African-Americans from Allen and other HBCUs were certainly well aware and more than willing to get involved and active 
in these campaigns. Now, in our next class after the deep dive next week, we'll get deeper into what students from Allen and Benedict are doing on the ground in Columbia during the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Uh, because especially in the early 1960s, those students are gonna be integral to the civil rights campaigns in the early 1960s. Of course, Bobby Donaldson through his Columbia 63 campaign has done yeoman's work on chronicling all of this. We'll talk more about that in, in the weeks to come. But for right now, Allen students are already starting to play a bit of a role in the movement and even more so in the 50s and 60s. Okay, I see Omari has a question as well. Uh, why do you surmise uh, we are still asking for the same platform after all the wins, big or small? Do you think Stacey Abrams and Georgia turning Democratic is a blue scare per the backlash and voting restriction? So answer the second part of that question first. Um, you are seeing in the South, uh, you saw this in North Carolina in the 2010s, and you're certainly seeing it in Georgia right now. There is concern about the Democratic Party making inroads in the South, not just with, with Black voters, but also with some moderate voters in both of these states, especially in urban centers like Charlotte and Atlanta, respectively. But I, I do think the Republican parties of the Deep South are, are very concerned about these states becoming what we will refer to in modern political parlance as purple states, states that are actually very competitive. Uh, we've actually, if you think about the, the, the grand history of, of Southern politics, most of its history has been as a region of one party control. Um, certainly after reconstruction onward of democratic party control uh, from the seventies through the nineties, you do have a, a, a brief era of two party competition in many Southern states. And in the last 20 years, you're starting to see many Southern states revert to one party rule again, except in this case, Republican party rule. Um, but when you're seeing states like Georgia and North Carolina that are important electoral college states, um, big states population wise, perhaps turning blue now and then, that's certainly going to concern Republicans who are looking at the electoral map more broadly speaking. Um, now as to your first question, why do you surmise we are still asking for the same platform uh, for generations on end? Um, I think it's primarily because the forces we are arrayed against are incredibly powerful too. Let's take, for example, universal healthcare. Universal healthcare was first part of a presidential platform under Theodore Roosevelt Progressive Party in 1912. We've been arguing about universal health care for over a century when it is taken for granted in many other industrialized nations. I actually have a friend of mine, a close friend of mine who lives in Uruguay, in South America, and they also have universal health care. But the forces that we're often talking about that these activists are going up against, the forces that Majesca Simpkins fought against, the forces that Joseph Delane and many others fought against. These forces, they take different forms from different generations, but they are incredibly powerful. Um, they may make concessions here and there. For example, James Burns actually pushing for a sales tax. They'll make concessions to do just enough to get by, but to not go any further than that. You tie that to the fact that many of these progressive movements in the 20th and 21st centuries are often uh, colored with the, the cry of communism or socialism. Um, or, or radicalism of some sort on the one hand. And then on the other, many of those same movements are seen as being too pro-Black, too pro-people of color, uh, too um, pro-big government, quote unquote. So really with what you're talking about here, Omari, it's really more of a question of how powerful the forces arrayed against progressivism and, and actual radical movements have been throughout American history. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right, you're right. I, I mean, Germany already had universal health care in the late 19th century. Um, they also had um, social, basically social security. They had old age pensions long before the United States did. Um, I think that's one other thing about the school that's really important is that the United States, and, and this is, I don't want to think about the context here, but the United States is not necessarily the fount of all progressive ideas about the use of government, the use of, of taxation, et cetera. On the contrary, the United States is often trying to follow everyone else in, in a wide range of social welfare programs, ideas about democracy and, and government and voting rights, et cetera. 
And that makes the job that many of us are talking about doing of being actively engaged citizens in South Carolina very difficult. And also one last thing to Amari's point, many of those forces that we're talking about that have stymied progress in the country for centuries have their origins in South Carolina, or at the very least have some of those prominent thinkers promoting those ideas coming out of South Carolina and the cauldron of, of race and discrimination that continues to govern the state even today. Any other questions? I have Dr. Emily Robertson. Okay, go ahead. My question is about um, the SCETV, the, um, the bandware with um, e-learning and virtual learning and a lot of these schools having to do uh, drive buses into communities that don't have Wi-Fi for these kids to learn and have. They're having the buses come in the evenings and being there a certain time frame when a lot of kids' parents don't get home till late, um, but the bus is only going to be there a certain time. Why can't the school system, and I know you, they're saying it will be socialism, but there needs to be some type of way where, or what are your thoughts on it, where these people, where ETV can provide, because if we've already got all these, you know, satellites all over the place that we own, why aren't we using them to the best? Um, that is a really excellent question, uh, Ms. Robertson. And it's one that they can only answer by saying that they don't want to compete against the people that give them a lot of money that AT&T and the telecoms are huge lobbyists. There, there is no legitimate answer to why the state of South Carolina is keeping the taxpayers from accessing the educational broadband that we paid for. And so what county are you in, ma'am? I'm in Lawrence County. Well, I'm on the let, lower end of Lawrence County. You know, it's a big difference in well, the, the lower the, end and the upper end of the, Lawrence County. We, we, we need to resurrect the fight. I, I fought it and, and, and have, I felt like Chicken Little because nobody understood what I was talking about. But um, this was the one thing that South Carolina could be the number one nation leader in, and it got quashed. But um, if, if you're interested in that, uh, email me. I'll give you my, my email address. And let, let's talk about you getting up with how to do this in Lawrence County. We're looking for um, uh, either a municipality, a town can do this, a nonprofit can do this to be able to establish a uh, access to a free broadband system that's owned by the state. All right, any other questions for the good of the order this evening? All right, then. Well, I think that's, um, that's it for the actual class portion. Um, now, remember, next week, uh, Dr. Eric Gelman is going to be joining us for a deeper dive into the SNYC um, and what it was doing in Columbia in 1946. Now, the, the deeper dive for next week, I think, is, is particularly important because we want to give you guys a sense of how the movements, the movement history in South Carolina goes way beyond just the NAACP. Um, and how SNCC in the 40s really represents that. And not just in South Carolina, but across the South. We, we tend to think of, of Southern organizing as the NAACP, the SCLC, and maybe SNCC of the 1960s. But as you're going to see, as you saw tonight and certainly next week, organizing in the Deep South was much, much more complicated than that and in many ways much more radical than many folks might have believed. Um, and oh, oh, Ian mentioned Hammer and Ho, one of my favorite books. Um, for folks who are interested in the history of the Communist Party in the Deep South, especially in Alabama, I would highly recommend Hammer and Ho. Uh, it was just, actually, I think you can go online and read it for free via UNC Press. I'll try to see if that link's still available or not and give it to the class. Um, but again, next week, that's our deeper dive with the SNYC. And then the week after that, we're going to be getting into uh, class number five, where we'll be talking about 
the era from 1955 to 1969, where you're seeing movements uh, for civil rights in South Carolina, but also you're seeing uh, the rise of the modern Republican Party in South Carolina, and also, of course, the Vietnam War becoming a topic of well, it was a tad bit of debate across the country during the late 60s about the Vietnam conflict. Um, but Brett, you have anything else to add this evening? Well, Robert, what I want to add is that you, you're excused if you need to go grade papers, that Robert has a real job. He gets paid for it at Claflin. And you can stay, Robert, but we're going to like let people leave that want to leave and let people stay that want to stay because we think that this kind of getting to know each other and doing some open mic chat is productive. We'll do that for a little while. But Dr. Green, you are a blessing and a treasure to South Carolina. Thank you so much. And I think that we should all give, unmute your microphone and clap for Robert, okay? Oh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Green. Yeah. This, this class Great is not job. about the students. So thank you, everyone, for participating this evening. <laughs> and so, uh, Dr. Green, are you leaving us now? We're going to talk about you if you don't leave. Well, I, you don't I have I, to. You this is actually to. our finals week, so I, I have actually great papers for real this evening. <laughs> well, well, thank you, sir, for sharing so much with us. And thank you. Well, I just we we, we want to just simply open the open the floor to people to talk about what it is that they're what chain they got yanked or what they've got to add to what we've been discussing. And if nobody nobody has anything to say, we can all like okay. Um, okay. Eat something. <laughs> Okay. Jane, you're talking. Go for it. I, uh, I, I think I want to eat, <laughs> but I, I am very much interested in this uh, um, Pamela Robertson's problem and working with anybody who wants to work together to work on the TV station, uh, TV, getting TV into those areas. That that's something that I, I I it was during Obama's second year. If somebody can tell me what decade that was in, I can't even remember. That this all happened, and it was to me a really 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 significant thing. And I raised hell, and I spent all this time doing it, and it just didn't it didn't go anywhere. And yeah. that if you want to uh, help Ms. Robertson, y'all, I will give you all the information. I will give you all the tech specs. And you raise hell. And what we need to do is to make an example. We need to do it somewhere right. so people right. understand what we're talking about. Yep. Get a platform. That's yeah. why I'm going to call Cecil. <laughs> you got my number, honey. Call me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Hey, Brett. This is Christine Gaynor. And I had a question. Um, you mentioned before that our schools are funded by zip code. Do you, know, is that like law that it's done that way or how is that done? Why aren't we funded by county, for example? Well, what, what you would anticipate is that all counties and all schools and all districts would have equal funding for students. And that funding has historically been based on property taxes. And right. then the really poor counties, they ain't got no money. And exactly. so we're sorry, but that the rich counties which definitely equates generally to the white counties have more funding and better schools. And so the separate but equal thing has never worked out and won't work out until we have equal funding. And there's been a school equity funding lawsuit for how long, Cecil? Oh my God, 20? Yeah, since the early 1990s, the Abbeville versus South Carolina. Yeah, 20 plus years, or is that 30 now? It's and so, uh, Christine, I don't know uh, how long you've been in South Carolina, but this is a very long and tortured story about the, the structural impediments to equality um, and predicated on race and income. Right. And I, I understood it was, you know, done by property taxes and, and that, you know, where it comes from. But just is it mandated that it's by zip code or how, how was it carved out? To what, be what is mandated is there's an amount that is appropriated by the state to give to each student. What is it this year, Cecil? 28, 25? 20. Well, I don't know the exact figure. It's whatever is minimally adequate. Yeah, but it's there, there's an annual amount that's appropriated by the state to, to all counties. And last time I paid attention, it was like $2,800 a student. And so then you your county can then kick in money. Well, if your county ain't got no money, we're sorry, you don't get adequate education. 
even to, to make a finer point about the zip code question, if you take a county like Spartanburg County, which is divided up into seven districts, hmm. up in the northern end of the county, the northeast end where uh, uh, Pakalit is, where they've got uh, some still, uh, still a high tax base, even inside one county, that school district and Spartanburg District uh, 3, I think it is, have higher tax bases than the other districts inside Spartanburg County. So they spend a great deal more because they've got the big, better tax base. They spend a great deal more on their schools than uh, Spartanburg. Uh, well, one I think is, um, uh, what's the one? Uh, but, um, Landrum. Spartanburg one is Landrum. Spartanburg uh, three is where Jim Ray used to be the superintendent over in Packlet. Well, yes. Christine, this is a continual struggle that I'm, I'm glad you're tuning into. I don't know that we can solve the problem this evening. I just appreciate the answer. I, I didn't know if there was something mandated or exactly how it worked it, here. It, so, it, it is indeed them. set the limit that the state puts in and right. then the counties can put in what they want to. Okay. Mitzi, I see, I saw Mitzi's hand up, Ian. Hi. Yeah. Oh, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can't see, okay. but we can hear you. Here, I'll, t I, I, there you are. <laughs> I, I guess I have kind of a Cecil question. Um, hello. So if the schools are based on zip code, how and why are they allowed to be so drastically different between, I mean, we're talking like just an example of between Rosewood and South Kilbourne. I think the amount of funding that goes between those two schools in the same, dis I mean, they're half mile apart how is that acceptable well i i i i simplified it by saying zip code cecil yeah he was speaking euphemistically it is not <laughs> actually funded by zip code but as he pointed out under the education finance act of 1977 there's a formula inside the the efa that is supposed to yield the per pupil expenditure that's to be funded in the annual budget that the legislature adopts since 1977, the EFA per pupil expenditure has only actually been fully funded fewer than this many times. Uh, what they do then is that they, they fund everything else that they want to fund in the budget, whatever our legislators priorities, and then whatever is left over out of the fund, out of the treasury, they divide among the number of students in the entire state and that becomes their per pupil expenditure for that year. So if the EFA formula, let's say, says that the per pupil expenditure this year should be $3,600 per pupil, if what they've got left after they spend on their real priorities is only $2,800 per pupil, they declare that to be the per pupil expenditure, which means they can violate their own law. Uh, and then once they appropriate in the budget that bucket of money, out to each school district statewide, as uh, Brett said, then each school district statewide can augment that amount of money out of local funds that they raise from their own tax base. That's how uh, wealthy school districts like Ori or Greenville, um, Richland, the Richlands um, are able to pay their teachers a higher salary supplement, a local salary supplement and to afford things for their schools, extra resources or capital outlay for improvements to their buildings than a county like Allendale or Jasper or pick any Marion County, any in the corridor of shame. That's how it's done. And the predication on the, the struggle that's been going on since the 90s is equity funding. And we, we haven't gotten there. And so it's a struggle that needs to be continued. That answer your question, Mitzi, I'm sorry that the answer sucks. No, it, and it's something that I, it's intrigued me for years watching, it's so weird to talk with headphones on, mm. how close in proximity, and I'm a real estate agent, so home values can be similar in areas and yet they get sent to schools that are drastically different. Um, and it just seemed like, you know, these kids are within, you know, they play together on the same playgrounds and yet one is sent to a school where they're drastically underfunded versus, you know, the white kid who gets to go around the corner to a, a much better funded school. Thank you. Yes, yet another problem. Ian? If, if I could add to that, um, 
like I live in Anderson, right? And uh, so so just just here, like I I grew up where one like like the the area itself still hasn't actually to a degree like segregated. So you have West Side on on the West End, where that is where the the, the majority of, of the, the poor kids go. Um, and then you Teal Hannah, which is where the majority of the rich kids go. Now, of, of course, that is also typically a separation of white and black, right? And so the, the East Side, which has Teal Hannah, the school is massively funded. You have the, the programs just boom, booming every single one, right? All the like extra curriculars going crazy with with funding easily and then on the the west side everything is getting defunded they are stripping the the school of of everything outside of the base programs and um the the same principle of applies where like like one side of a street can't can go to to west side or, or one side of street can go to Teal Hannah and, and largely it's more or less a arbitrary motion decided by the uh, uh, local districts. It, it's got something to do with the, the pension for organizing around class in this country. Um, it, it's, it's the same problem we're facing on damn near everything else. No, everything else, yeah, whether that's health care, education, uh, housing, et cetera. And so that's what the Majeska School is about, is to try and train people up to understanding wh what the problems are, who made the rules, and who benefits from them today. And so if we want some kind of equality that helps tamp down the level of disparity and violence and you know, deprivation, we're going to have to do some organizing. And so that's what we're about. Closing in on 9 o'clock, one or two more questions, or we're going to all go eat dinner now. Okay, time out, folks. So <laughs> seeing no hands raised. Lordy, I appreciate y'all being here because it would be so boring to do this with nobody out there to listen. And uh, I'm so gratified that um, it seems to be something that's productive. Becky, say something. I just really want to applaud Cecil because you really brought a lot to the table today. And thank you. Cecil is deeply embedded in the educational system. And, and um, we're... He's he was he's in Mississippi right now, by the by, but we have the benefit of him having a home in South Carolina, and and being so versed in the uh, inequities of education and being so committed to struggling against those inequities. And thank you so much, Mr. Coho. Becky, I appreciate that, and I thank you all for the work that the Progressive Network does now and always has done. I appreciate your inviting me to participate tonight this way. It's not over. Well, thank you, everybody. We're going to go. We're going to go eat dinner now. And we appreciate you coming. Next Monday is going to be killer because there's some things that happen. Oh, I can tell y'all. Don't tell anybody else. That one of the things that's just so incredible is that we're going to talk about what happened after this remarkable conference in Columbia, South Carolina, 1946, when there was like thousands of people, an overflowing crowd. Man, they ratcheted down on them folks. And Majesco helped organize the next meeting in 1948 in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, you may remember 48, things are really boiling. We got like lefties running for president and righties running for president, Strom Thurmond versus Henry Wallace. And Henry Wallace's vice presidential nominee, a U.S. senator, was invited to be the keynote speaker at the Southern Negro Youth Congress meeting in Birmingham in 1948 and he called and said I, I'm not, I can't come they're leaning on me it's going to look really bad if the vice presidential candidate goes and speak to these commies and Majeska got on the phone to him and talked him into coming and when he went there was it was in the fourth black church the first three caved and canceled and the fourth one was a smaller place and they didn't have an extra door for white people to come in. And it was the law in Birmingham that you had to have separate entrances for black and white people. And so they took the door and turned it sideways. And one side of the door said colored, one side said white. 
And Mr. Taylor, who was the vice president of the nominee, he's a senator, yes, senator, went through the wrong door. And I'm assuming that it was on purpose or even if it was inadvertently, he ended up being arrested by Bull Connor, who arrested the vice presidential candidate of the United States, a sitting U.S. senator, for going through the wrong door in a black church in Birmingham, Alabama. And that was pretty much the end of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. So stay tuned for more heartwarming stories from the Deep South next Monday. Be here. Good night, everybody. Good night. So we can tell who's actually asleep at the wheel because their thing is still showing and they're not here. I'm not. So. I'm trying to get <laughs> Marjorie Hammock. Oh my God, she's still alive. I've been here all night. Well, show your face, woman. Why? <laughs> we love you. And I don't even know how to do that now. I think I've signed out altogether. Well, I, no, you uh, haven't signed out because we keep hearing you. Okay. Well, I don't know what to do. Um, well, I'm looking uh, at uh link to tonight's class is what I'm seeing. Um, well, Ms. Hammock. Okay. I'm anyway, sorry that I your daughter is not available to push I'm the right button get, for I'm you. I'm not getting my I'm not getting my my notification about the meetings. I'm signing it and on Jean stuff usually. But my Are name. did Jean leave? Or I y'all so. broadcasting from different locations? Yes, yes. But okay. she had to send me a link in order for me to sign on, and I was going to call you tomorrow. And well, let me tell you that we're having more trouble with our email than the last 25 years. And okay. I don't think it's us, trust me. You it's know what, though, like oh, I think. The I evil, think the the evil corporations are now fighting amongst themselves to control our lives. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I think, but, it was, I think it was the way in which I originally signed in. Because I have... I've always had to depend on this year. I've had to depend on her to send me stuff. Well, I'll tell you a secret. That we use a, telling you we, that. Use, we use the same link every time. If you save the link that we use tonight and you okay. click it next, next, next Monday at 630, you're there. What you're I'm not supposed to do I, that, but we're very trusting people. And so we let people use the same thing every night. Right. Every but I also, don't, I also don't get my materials is what I'm saying. She has to send me the stuff. <sighs> All right. Well, we need a personal. We need a personal intervention. Okay. And we should do that, and uh, Becky Robbins will be in close communication with you uh, in your backyard over a cocktail <laughs> as soon as possible. It's ready for you. <laughs> Good night, yes. you all. Pool open, Marjorie. Hello, darling. How are you? Is your pool open yet? No, not yet. Not right. yet. Call me. Call let's me when wait, you want to cover wait. that girl. Uh, when 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 it hits about 85, 87 degrees, I'll call you. <laughs> It'll Good be night, a... Marjorie. Good night. Good night, Beck. Are there any other like humanoids here other than, than yeah, um, Keith on. Gray? I'm still on. Well, I just moved you. You're gone. <laughs> Good night. Another great class. I really enjoy this. Yeah, Keith, yeah, you had a question. I can't remember what it was that you put in, in, the, in the chat that I don't know got answered, but it might have been about the union thing. It was more a remark or comment. Okay, okay. And uh, we do need to talk about getting you information in terms of the Medicaid stuff. Oh, you, um, you sent me that was stuff. that was a different different thing that you conversation you were having. Yeah. But that um, Biden is like talking about putting more juice, more money into the Medicaid expansion. And I really do think that you got to talk to DSA and, and um, our revolution about getting off this like kind of national platform where they're gonna think they're gonna convince Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott to support universal healthcare and focus yeah. on something actually that a governor in 2022 in South Carolina can bring in a billion and a half dollars a year to provide healthcare for South Carolina. Totally agree, totally agree. Okay. I'm, I'm, Most everyone said, when someone says, well, why don't you talk to Graham and Scott? Said, why? Their ears are plugged. <laughs> Let's just get right. the people on this. All right. you know, and I really like the way Biden is framing bipartisanship. I yeah. think he's got a great idea on that. We only get so much done. So any, anybody else here have something to say? Because I'm going to hang this thing up here. <laughs>
I got called night, for everybody. Too. Thank you, Keith. Night. Thank you, Rebecca and Anna and Dr. Davis uh, and uh, Daniel, if you're still here, goodbye. <laughs>